Schoolism's having a sale. From now until June 3rd, get $100 off a year's subscription to classes taught by industry masters, from illustration to painting to design, 28 classes in all. We've already added two new classes this year, Introduction to Visual Development with Victoria Yang and Environment and Light with John Burton, with three more coming soon. And they'll be available to subscribers right at launch. The Schoolism Spring Sale. Check it out today at schoolism.com. Welcome to Schoolism Interviews miniseries with your host, Bobby Chu. John Burton is an award-winning plain air painter and fine artist. He's a signature member of the Plain Air Painters of America, a popular speaker at events such as the Plain Air Convention in San Diego, the Plain Air Expo and Convention in Monterey, California, the Laguna Plain Air Painters Reception in Laguna Beach, California, among many others. He has been featured in publications such as Fine Art Connoisseur, Outdoor Painter Magazine, Art of the West Magazine, and more. We're lucky and excited to have him as an instructor for Environment and Light with John Burton on Schoolism.com. Today, John joins Bobby for this miniseries on his philosophies, techniques, and of course, art and life as an artist. We hope you enjoy it. Hey John, so in your class, uh, Environment and Light with John Burton on Schoolism, there are so many wonderful lessons that we can talk about, but I would love to talk about lesson four. I'd love to talk to you about your thoughts on color. More specifically, how do quick decisions in color serve in developing a more authentic piece of art? Great, yeah, so that is a huge thing as trying to be a, a representational or impressionist painter is authenticity, is telling the truth, is we're going out and we're trying to be honest and tell the truth about what the world looks like. And before I even get into color, I'll share an example with that, is how do we, how do we study color and how do we get an authentic, truthful experience when the, when the viewer sees our painting? And the example I give is, imagine that you're writing a novel about Venice, okay? So you're good, you can't wait to write this novel and you look all these things up on the internet about Venice. You've never been to Venice, but you look it up, you look up pictures, you look up stories, and then you write your novel. It's, the internet's pretty darn good. You're gonna write a pretty good novel. Compare that to the novel of the person who lived in Venice. They live in Venice, they've eaten the food, they know what it smells like, what it tastes like, what the sounds are like, what everything looks like, what it looks like in, and, and, and smells and tastes in the morning or at night that person is going to write a much more authentic book about Venice than the person who was studying it on the internet. And that is what us plein air landscape painters are doing when we're studying color. Because when we're looking at a photo, we're looking at a second generation. We're telling the world, this is what a camera thought of the world. But when we go outside, we're telling the, the world, this is what we thought of the world. And so when you go out and paint, New Zealand should look different than Canada, which would look different than the Bahamas, which would look different than the Grand Canyon. You can pick anywhere in the world and it should have a different look and it does. And when you go out and study it, it's studying color outside is so wonderful. Like you can't believe that this is what you should be doing when you're studying or when you're painting outside because going out and studying what I call color notes, you're not really studying the color. It, and then the reason I call them notes is it's the music. You're going out to study the music of nature. And so you're studying these color notes and how they relate to each other. And I have never seen anyone who stays in the studio who is able to capture the harmonies that nature provides. When you're outside, the harmonies are, are so beautiful. They, and harmonies mean those relationships. So coming back to in a full round in that and how do you, do you get the authentic color is when you're outside, it is really important to have these quick decisions. And there is a, I talk about this in the lesson, there's a book uh, by Malcolm Gladwell called Blink. And the book is a, a best-selling book about uh, reacting to things. Sometimes you react to things quicker, better than a long drawn out process. And color is certainly that way. There's something called uh, eye fatigue. And as the more you study a color, the more you study and study and look at it, your eye actually tires. And so you're not actually seeing the right color. So by going outside, and making quick decisions and knowing as we paint outside or even in the studio as you're, as you're making quick decisions that the more you make these decisions quickly on color, 
the better you get at it. Solomon J. Solomon, who said, we don't, uh, we don't get stronger by watching other men lift weights. I love that quote. And it's, it, it's that, the, if we want to improve our color, if we want to improve our painting, then, and we want more authentic color, we need to make better decisions and we need to go to the source. By going out and studying nature and studying our world, which is which is so funny because doing that is is such a gift anyway, right? Unplugging ourselves from our millions of things that we're plugged into, our TV, our computer, our iPhone, and going in a walk outside in nature or, or even in a park near your house and just studying light. It, it's not like you're getting asked to walk across hot coals. You're getting asked to do something that is actually really enjoyable the more you do it. A lot of times as we are starting off in art or maybe even have a few years in art, it's still very difficult to actually know the color that we're looking at because, of course, we've had way more years bringing in all the information into our brains, filtering it, changing the the context of what we're seeing and going, yeah, that is a white shirt, even though it's, you know, 11 p.m. at night and uh, it's Obviously, if you looked at it and I dropped it in Photoshop or something, that's a blue shirt. It's a dark blue shirt. So how do we kind of, how do we help ourselves be able to distinguish the exact, you know, the real kind of stuff that we're seeing? So uh, because when you uh, go out, you need to describe to somebody, right? If it's nighttime, your example, hey, could you go look for my buddy? He's in a white shirt. But you're right. It's not white. If you, if you, I dropped it. So the way the, the experience is, one is observation skills. Another problem when you talk about that is when you uh, look at a distant mountain. We look at a distant mountain and we think it's green, not because it's the local color, but because we know trees are green, right? But it's, you were looking through atmosphere. And that's in a, a later lesson as well in, in discussing that. But I'm a big advocate and the way I paint, I consider myself a temperature painter. And what a temperature painter to me is, is dealing with relationships. And so when you're dealing with relationships, instead of I have to mix that white shirt, as soon as I see a shirt white, my brain tells me white and I have to mix it white. But if I look at it and say, I'm dealing with relationships, okay, I've got my values right, which I, I talked about in an earlier lesson about values. If I get my values correct, first thing I'm going to see in that shirt is it's way darker than white. So I know that value is not white. Then the next thing is, I'll compare one piece next to the next piece next to the next piece, and that will give me the relationship in color because he's next to a red neon sign and then a dark alley. And I'll start comparing those and say, okay, he's not red. And he's not this dark alley. What dark, what temperature does he bend or move towards? And that will help get me the actual color of, of what I'm visually seeing. When you think back to when you were first kind of practicing with color and things like that, was it like kind of like in your mind you try to spread out that tiny little speck so you see a more area of that flat color and try to eliminate everything else around that color? That I'm trying to explain how I kind of think about it, actually. Yeah. Is that how you do? Yeah. So you take the color, explain. So you take the color and you take like that one speck. Yes, and I try to enlarge it in my imagination, right? So I could try to see it as this flat color and try to like almost dim out or put everything else in my peripheral vision to try to see that color a little bit clearer yeah another version i've seen before that i never tried is like cutting out a little cardboard kind of thing right that's what i got where you're going with it the viewfinder oh yeah maybe you can explain that one yeah so yeah i do not use viewfinders uh myself personally because it's, it, I've tried to take all tools away, right? So my eye just sees that, but it is a valid, wonderful way to work. So uh, what a viewfinder is like, you're trying to pick a color. And this is a great thing when, you, when you're first going outside because it's hard to tell what any color is. So if you have, it, you can make your own. You take a cardboard or a piece of paper and you put a very small hole punch through it. And I mean, really small. It can be the size of a, punch that you would put a paper into a binder. It could be just a pen that you stuck through. Then hold that up so it's blocking all color and then take a look at that color. And when you do it, what's, what's amazing with that is I think you'll always be shocked. We will always be shocked at how gray it is because that's gray is an elegant color. Like all our colors are far more gray than we think 
because they're all being affected by the same world. They're affected by the same light, same atmosphere. So they all are influenced by each other far more than we think instead of going right out of the tube. So that's certainly a way. I tend to more pick a, a keying my painting by a certain color, and then I base every relationship off that. And quite often I'll look at a color like, let's say an ocean color and say, I think I can mix that color or a red barn or a really golden tree. And I'll say, I think that's the one I can really put down the best. Once I put it down, now every relationship's based on that. Or it might be, you know, getting into whoever I think my star is. If it is a really fall foliage, beautiful gold tree, I might be really trying to mix that at the beginning and then base all the other colors to help that look bright. That's really interesting, especially that point about uh grays being more elegant. Is that why when we look at uh, paintings in Hawaii with these super blue, you know, skies with super green trees and all this stuff, it can look kind of tacky sometimes. It's, yeah. it's hard to make it look elegant. Totally. I agree with that. It can get really garish. And, and what it ends up looking, it looks out of control. So it doesn't look like the artist was quite in control. It looks more like the pain, the painting got the got pulled the reins and pulled the control away. But yeah, you're right. And that's it's really this is, by the way, Bobby, in my life, this is my lifelong battle. It's not, it is a lifelong battle to get saturated color versus not saturated and make it balance in a painting. Because when I say gray is elegant, if you paint a fully gray painting, it's just gonna look dreary. But what I, but whatever I'm going with it is graying color, desaturating color, so you can control where the color goes. And it is, I can't tell you, it's a battle for life, but it's an enjoyable battle, is how do I do that? How do I pull the reins back here, but let them go a little bit here? But as soon as I let it go everywhere, it just is a, a visual mess, because in the end, then we're not telling the viewer what was important to us. I guess this is another way I would say it is, I'm writing a story and I, in my story, there's 42 different characters in the first couple pages that you have to follow. Instead, in the first couple pages, the first chapter, I'm kind of setting up this story is about so-and-so and that's what the painting is. I'm trying to let you know the story is about this person, this tree, this, uh, it can be in landscape, it can be anything. It'd be the, the dappled light on the ground. That's my story. And as soon as I get too garish of color, I don't, the viewer doesn't know what my story is. So everybody watching this, definitely try now to pay more attention to how gray things are. The power of uh, gray and how it can be a very elegant mix of things and how to use that in your paintings. If you want to know more, definitely check out John Burton's class on schoolism. Environment and Light with John Burton. Not only will you learn about color, you'll learn about value, temperatures, atmosphere, all sorts of stuff, as well as assignments to download to truly absorb all the lessons from John. That's on schoolism.com, Environment and Light with John Burton.